I'm going to be uh, showing you some stuff about natural edge turning. Um, you know, whenever you uh, are looking at natural edge turning, of course, the shape of the wood itself kind of affects your final product in a way that it, it just won't with other, other types of turning. A few things you have to consider is, of course, the of course, the, the diameter of the limb or the piece of wood. Now, this came from a relatively small, you know, if you take a look, eh, it was maybe yay big around. This was actually a limb off of a, uh, an ornamental cherry tree in our front yard. It died. Um, there is one problem with it, and that is the, the, uh, uh, bark kind of rode up on it as it as it dried. I'm not sure exactly what to do with that. I might slit it and take out a little section and glue it back down. I don't know. And notice it is like nicely spalted. Um, this now these two came from from limbs that were about the same size. It's just the difference in length and how you, you know how how much with width or diameter you decide to use. Uh, uh, this was just something I kind of knocked around. Uh, this came out of a gum tree that we uh, had trimmed up in our yard. So were these. Now you notice this is, this is just a bigger version of this basically. A little bigger limb off of that same tree. Um, another thing to consider is on this one, I just used half of the limb. On this one, I went almost all the way through. If you'll see, the, the center is right here. That adds some interesting complication to the turning because um, it's going to crack and change shape, and it's it's going to going to add add some complexity to it. <coughs> to put this in perspective, you know that cherry tree you cut down? Here is a piece off of something about that size. And notice, notice the crack. Uh, that's after three weeks. Of course this is, you know, a nice small piece. So somehow getting this to dry without cracking in this form is going to be kind of a challenge. Mm -hmm. I haven't been able to accomplish it for the most part. I know the way I normally do this is I turn and, and sand all in one session and then kind of let it dry however and yeah it's going to distort but you tell me how much this is distorted and how much it's not round. Not entirely round. Uh, you know, just because of the shape of the top you really can't see it anyway. Um, one thing I have been playing around with is going ahead and pretty much finish turning it and then just sticking it in sawdust and we'll see if that cuts down on the cracking or not. I don't know, but that's for another year uh, because it's going to be a while. Now here's a smaller piece and this one I'm going to talk about a little bit then pass around. Uh, here is the center of this. Okay, and what that means is that this was a limb. It wasn't vertical. And what happened is the tree, to try to support the weight, grew more on the bottom to support it. Uh, whenever you're turning something where this is off center, it's going to distort more than if you're just turning something that is in you know, like those aren't going to distort too much because uh, those cherry pieces because they came from the vertical part of the tree. These limbs, they're going to distort more. They're going to try to crack on you more. It's just something you have to keep in mind while you're turning. And then, you know, I did a couple of a couple of drawings for a bowl that was just one side and bowl that went through the through the center and and how that works. Go ahead. I look at that a little closer. 
Okay. Another thing is picking how the turning is going to go. Now this, I was actually going to chuck this one up first today, but I don't think I will. Uh, notice I did that instead of just chucking up the, the whole piece of wood. And the reason why I had planned on doing that here is, okay, I have this, I have my chuck mounted, and you will notice that I have my spur drive mounted into the chuck. And that makes it a whole lot easier instead of taking that chuck on and off every time I start a new turning. Um, and it, we'll see that there's a little groove right here. I don't know what the groove is supposed to be for, but it works real well to be gripped by, by your tool, so your, your chuck. So it's not going anywhere. Anyway, I was playing around with, with these. I don't know, I, I turned bits and pieces of four or five of them. I have two or three here. Um, and I threw two or three of them off the lathe because no matter how hard I would squeeze this tip down, the bark is very hard and resisted, but it's not hanging on very hard. And so whenever I'm turning and I'm trying to gut up or trying to hog off some material, uh, it came loose and started flying. So I was gonna cut through that to keep that from happening. You've heard how to do it now. We're gonna see that as enough. And I'll just go ahead and chuck this one up where I've already where I've already cut the uh, cut the tenon in it so we can uh, hang on to it a lot better and hopefully we won't be flying through the room. Okay, another thing to think about with these turnings is, you know, how do you pick what you're going to turn? Like I have this little piece of walnut, came out of the same tree that that one did. Uh, you know that big wind we had, uh, what, three weeks ago? it topped out one of my walnut trees. And so, you know, it wasn't real big, the, the top of it. But anyway, this is a piece out of it. And, you know, when I get around to turning this, um, now this is gonna be just straight grained. This is probably a heel over from an old limb that fell off the tree. And this, was a little limb that came off of it, and I don't know why it uh, has this kind of growth area, but there might very well be some interesting figure in there. And so probably what I'm going to do is turn the bowl kind of out of this so that so that we might have some interesting grain in there. And a lot of this natural life stuff. Now this is, I think I may have mentioned a huge burl that was on the side of this sassafras tree just a half a mile from my house. It, it had died and unfortunately this is not going to be quite as nice a material as it would have been had I gotten it two or three years ago before it died. Um, but anyway, you know there's a lot that you could do with something like this. Probably what I'm going to do is whack it right here and use this pretty much squared up piece and I don't know maybe turn a vase, maybe a hollow vessel, something like that. And then I'm going to have this, and you know, this is such nice material. I'm not sure I really want to just throw this away. Now, for show and tell, I forgot to show you this. This came out of that. And I may very well turn something else that kind of looks like this, kind of, kind of from the side. So, um, you know, just all sorts of options. You can take that and pass it around a bit. Uh, just all sorts of options you have on how you can do natural edge stuff. And then of course, now there's going to be a little bit of a crotch in here. And probably what I would do with this is maybe go in at a little bit of an angle or something or other. So I have some of the crotch, but still kind of centered on, on this 
underlying piece of wood. Um, you know, some of this just has to do with learning how to read the trees. Does yeah. That, does that hole go all the way through on the bottom? Uh, mostly. You know, that might be just a might be just an interesting feature. The little the little uh, turning I passed around has some holes like that in there. Or it may not work. The nice thing is, whenever you're doing this kind of turning, you usually don't spend a whole lot of the material, so it's not like you're heartbroken if a piece breaks. And trust me, that does happen. Um, nice thing is, whenever you're turning like this, you're not in the line of flight. Um, still, if you're going to be doing this kind of turning, you absolutely have to wear a face mask. Um, it could have gotten ugly many times. Uh, so yeah, that, that's how I turned that. Let's go ahead and just go ahead and check this one up. wet uh i only turn wet okay wood. now there is a hole just and make sure you have that that chuck tightened up nice and tight What I have found, I tried to turn this slowly, like, you know, three, four, five hundred RPMs, and I found that I'm bouncing all over the place. It actually goes a lot smoother and easier if you crank up the RPMs to more like 800. Um, which again is another reason since you're turning stuff I mean I could have I could have rounded this off with a bandsaw um, but I assume probably not everybody in here has a bandsaw and so I'm going to show you how to do it without needing a bandsaw all you need is a lathe and something to cut this thing in half or cut this thing off a tree with and you, you can go um, so anyway yeah, I'm going to be turning probably about 800 RPMs or so uh, Oh, and here's another thing. This is wet, and I will be generating heat. And um, another thing that I had happen whenever I was playing around with these things is I would turn for maybe a minute tops, and the chuck would start spinning because it was already drying, and I, I could tighten up fairly, fairly, fairly substantially. Um, even after turning for a minute. So this thing is really wet and it is, well, I'll just have to keep remembering to tighten it up. Okay now. Making the blade for making the lathe wobble a little bit. So, okay, I'm at I'm at 700 RPM now. tighten it a little bit. Come on. Okay, what did I do? The controls on this one work a little different than mine. Oh, 
by the way, another thing, you know, whenever uh, these professionals try to teach you how to use these tools, use a light touch. Just hold it gently. No! When you're turning this kind of thing, you hang on this thing with this thing for dear life because it wants to bounce all over the place. Yep. I would consider it a source of pride to be able Okay. Demonstrator learned something here. Yeah. got the idea of what I'm going to do there. Now I'm going to cheat a little bit because I'm not thinking it'd be all that exciting, be all that exciting for you to watch me to continue to turn this thing. Whenever all I'm doing is just taking off more material and there's no new cuts or anything different I would be doing. So we're going to pretend that I've gone from this to this. Okay, so there is one step that I haven't demonstrated and that is this. Okay, um, I'm going to try to keep the bark on for this, this, and you notice that I haven't quite finished turning the outside edge here. Um, we have a little ways to go yet. And so I normally would not have turned this inside until I had the outside pretty much finished, maybe even sanded. I don't know, just kind of depends. Um, I did that because, you know, whenever, whenever you just have it in the chuck, there's a lot of torque out here. And again, you're having to remove a lot of material and the more material you can remove while the 
tail stock is in place, the better off you are. Now, I just turned this this morning, so we'll see how much it distorted. Oh, and I brought it in sawdust, wet sawdust that this thing had just, that had just come off of this thing. Let's see now. Okay, well, let's give this a try and see. Worst case scenario is I blow the bark off. Okay. It is wobbling a little bit, so it's already dried a little bit from this morning. I'll have to true it out first. Fascinating. Probably a pretty adequate outside turning. Now there are there are some tool marks in it. Um, you know, one of those things that I learned way back when is whenever you um, want to smooth things out, you use your tool. What I was taught is you drop you drop the tool rest down very low, and you ride the bottom of the tool rest, and you have the tool at a sharp angle so basically you are you are cutting at a very high angle and you can really shave off very small amounts okay the problem is I've never encountered a tool rest where you didn't start bumping into things on the tool rest that way okay the physics is if you raise this puppy up and you go at it like this it's the same angle but there's nothing on your tool rest in the way.
Okay, and whenever you start hearing that high-pitched whine, you just well stop because you're cutting little little uh, grooves and high points in it, and you're not going to get any smoother using that cut. For the most part, I took out most of the tool tool marks, though. And this one, I'm not sure that this piece is going to end up being a, very much of a bowl because it's got some it's got some punky places in it that I don't know if it'll work out or not. Okay, uh, so I pretty much have the outside turned to just about the shape I want. Um, at home, I would probably now sand it um, just because it's easier to do now uh, before it starts distorting. And then I start working on the inside. And if you want to keep, well, I mean, oh, here's the other thing. If you want to keep the bark on, you're better off if the tree was harvested in the wintertime. Don't know why, but that is the way it is. Probably has to do with the sap being up or down. Um, okay. Um, this was only harvested three weeks ago, so I've had pretty good luck keeping the bark on. Um, but the time it starts to spalt, you really have to use super glue to keep that, keep the bark on, or, or you're just not going to do it. It, it helps you super glue it right now. Yeah. Uh, also, it, when you do the super glue, uh, use a finish, use like a spray on poly or something on it first, and that way the glue won't stain the wood so much. This is so I don't glue up Lewis's lathe here. <laughs> All right, well, I was prepared to try the super glue thing or to use it on this. We'll just go ahead and do it. That also helps later on. That it, it, when you when you do the inside, uh -huh. super glue it too on the inside. Super glue it on the inside too. Right. And then that'll help. You said you'd have some problems with the bark and the wood separating uh, on the piece. That you know, if you do this now, that, that helps some on that. I'm not saying it's pure every time. I don't mean that at all. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well. See what we can do. Okay, now I'm I'm going to go ahead and get the tail stock out of the way now because that's turned about as much as it's going to be turned while I still have the tail stock on. Uh, generally, what what I try to do is so that the very center of my tool is in the center of the turning. So it's it's about half this thickness below is what I really prefer, um, at least for for this this part of the operation. All right, I might want to get these off of here. Oh, notice all I've used is this. I probably do 80% of my turning with this. This bowl, well, you can see it's not quite as long as it was whenever I bought it. You see, I'm knocking off this centerpiece that I that the uh, tailstock is supporting. And I'm going in directly with the head of the tool, just sticking it right in that, right in, right in the center, and then peeling it back. And you can do that all the way into the bottom of the bowl, but you gotta be real careful. Because if you go very far, you're going to catch. It'll only work right in the center of the bowl. Unless you're better at this than I am, I guess.
problem is, as this thing dries and the outside starts distorting a little bit, well, the inside will be running true. You'll be cutting true, and that varies the thickness of that outside edge a little bit. So you just got to kind of play around with it. That, that's part of why I do this all in one, one setting. I usually do not turn a little bit now and then come back later because it's already distorted too much and you're going to have to true up the outside before you before you continue. things there. One is notice how my tool was kind of skipping a little bit at times. Okay, there's two ways to fix that. You can either slow down your cut or you can speed up the lathe. Okay. now. of other little things. Notice whenever I'm taking the tool in, it's all one smooth motion and it goes all the way around. Um, the hardest part in turning any bowl is kind of where the side and the bottom starts joining. Um, it's very easy to be a little too aggressive with your cut and then you have a smooth outside and the inside is sort of shaped like this. Um, so, just doing a smooth motion kind of helps with that. Hey, in all honesty, did speeding it up make your cut smoother for you? Oh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. The lathe was kind of shaking a little bit whenever I started it because it was so unbalanced. But once you um, got the piece in, but, in balance. Yeah, once it's, it once it's, it's balanced, yeah, you can, you can crank it up faster. Okay.
when you're going through the bark into wet wood, which is going to be a lot softer, yeah. you're going to bounce. Yeah. Uh, you, you can't avoid that. Um, the, the biggest challenge is if you're turning like a, uh, at least for me, is if you're trying trying to keep a uh, uh, natural bark edge on like a piece of spalted red maple or sugar maple. Um, well, sugar maple is okay. Well, the, the problem I have is, okay, the, the spalted wood is kind of punky. Mm -hmm. The bark is hard mm -hmm. and the unspalted wood is hard. And so you're constantly hitting different densities of wood. And man, that makes it very, very challenging. Okay, now the way the way I do it to try to make sure that the inside and outside, well, the, the wall thickness is pretty much consistent is your bevel is parallel to the outside of, of the bowl. Um, and then you're gonna be going in at about the same angle and that's kind of nice. For a bowl this size, I no longer measure wall thickness because for the most part, um, I can watch it and get pretty close and then I can feel it and mm -hmm. that's, that's, gonna, that's gonna take it the rest of the way. Um, sometimes I do use this on the bigger ones or, yeah, most of the bigger ones because they're a little bit harder to tell. And then of course, if it's, if it's a hollow form thing, this, I'm, I'm probably just going, let's see how we're working. That's what I anticipated. Okay, I will, because my, my key won't work for that. Okay, Lewis saved the day. Okay. Now, so this lines up pretty well. So it's going to be centered. And nice thing is I still have the the divot there from where I originally started turning this and I might not even I might not even bother turning this I mean we're pretty much out of time now um, but that's how I that's how I chuck this up and then what I do is is turn the bottom until I have shaved this away until it's just a teeny tiny little tab at the bottom. And then, you know, somebody was talking about you know, just breaking it off and, and cutting it off. Or sometimes on these little ones, I will just go ahead and cut on through and then just, and then it'll be going very slow at that point. I'll, I'll, I'll have slowed it down a whole bunch and then just grab it and stop the lathe and just pull it off. Um, so that's kind of how I do that couple of little tidbits on sanding. You can use sandpaper for a lot of it, but from here out, you know, anytime I've tried to use sandpaper out there, what happens is as, as it comes around, you're hitting here and here harder and that thins the walls here. I've destroyed a few of those bowls that way. So I just use these. I don't use this one. It, it's hard. It doesn't have a cushion on it. And if I, the outside you can do fine with this. You try to do this on the inside, it's gonna bounce all over the place. I got these. This is relatively recent. I bought these. To replace some others I've just worn out. And this is a fun little kit because it has the spongy. And if for a bowl this size, you know, it's going to be a pretty sharp turn there at the bottom. You can put two of them on. And it's a lot more cushion. And I have found that to work really nicely. 
um, at least on the edges here and then inside. Uh, I pretty much do the whole thing with these on the inside now. Um, I believe so. I believe so. I mean, it's like five of them for what, 20 bucks or something like that, 15 or 20. They're not bad. Um, so, okay. Anyway, that's pretty much my whole demonstration. Uh, Y'all have any other questions or comments or concerns? You know, I really appreciate the audience participation this time because, you know, like, like I said, I think we're all learning stuff, and that's kind of what this is supposed to be about, I think. So I appreciate it. All right, thank you. All right, thanks, Greg. Very good.